I really don't care which direction it goes because like I have a strategy for each direction. Um, the real question becomes like how do I be how do I play this specific environment? It's not necessarily like do I Jolly stop? Real estate, find you the best rate. I'll do all Philly like Google Expressway. Talking to people who added a two and five, even a two six seven who always helping like oh, no time for no scrutiny. Beautifully moving and no, that's not up for the pay for the people. We fall like an eagle and all have been called to do something great. Yeah. All right, we're ready to go. All right, cool. All right, so everyone, want to want to welcome you all to our first official in the studio. Shout out to my boy Rose and Andy Ha for uh, the productions here, and uh, we're here for an upgrade. Albert Wu is my first guest. My name is John Lee, your local real estate agent here in the Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia area. Uh, again, we are here in Repercussion Studios. Shout out again to Andy. Thank you so much. Um, but Albert, what's good, man? Tell us, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you got going on, man. Yeah, so I, I'm an investor in uh, Philadelphia. I've been uh, buying houses here since uh, 2017. Right now, you know, like we've been just buying houses, renovating them, and uh, putting them uh, back on the market for rent and uh, refinancing. Okay. So as far as the strategy goes, we're gonna have um, a good amount of time to talk about like what you do and how you and how you've gotten there. But just from the beginning, like how did you start? Uh, what were some of the hurdles that you had to go over, and what were some of the things that you've accomplished? Yeah, I think in in the start, you realize that this game is a game that revolves around people. Mm. Real estate is a people game. It's not, you know, like construction, whatever. It's just knowing the right people, like finding the right people for the specific task that you need to get done and, you know, having them do the job. So that's that's pretty much the journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, just for our audience, there's so many people involved in a transaction, right? Like me being as an investor, I'm also obviously a real estate agent, so people use me for, for you know, for being a realtor. Um, there are title companies, there are insurance companies, uh, there are wholesalers, there are contractors, right? There's banks, there's lenders. Uh, that's what makes this industry so beautiful because there's so many ways you can skin a cat, right, to make money, right? So uh, what were, I mean, you briefly mentioned to our audience like the strategy that you use for um, either just like renovating and refinancing, which we'll get to, uh, potentially flipping a couple of houses. But um, for our beginner listeners, uh, just to whet the appetite a little bit, like go through your first experience on your first deal and uh, walk us through that. Yeah, so my, my first deal um, was when I was back in New York. I was going to the Real Estate uh, Investors Association and someone had approached me to be a lender on a deal and I didn't know if the guy could actually get it done so I said what about instead of me lending to you I'll buy it off of you so I ended up buying this house for about 130,000 in um I forget where it was it was like down in like Brookhaven area in Long Island and I gave him five grand we put a little bit of money in and we sold it for like 200 something so um it was my first transaction in the real estate in the real estate game was it one of those experiences where you're like all right well i'll let you borrow money i don't believe you um but let me buy it and when the guy was like yeah i'll sell it to you you're like oh shit like <laughs> was it one of those things or were you like oh wait like let's do it like because i think a lot of the times a lot of beginners right like when they're given an opportunity like that they'll freeze right or they won't take action like what made you kind of make that decision very quickly yeah, so when I first started out, I went to um, real estate investment seminars, and mm -hmm. what that gave me was some level of confidence. And plus, I was 25, so I was just like, I'm invincible. I could do anything. So I kind of jumped head in, not necessarily knowing exactly what I was doing and just kind of throwing you know, spaghetti on the wall, per se. Yeah. And that gave me the opportunity to test that out. And before that, I was working with other people just to like do lending. So that gave me the opportunity to um, find that kind of opportunity because we were lending money at that time at 65% loan to value, which means that if the house is worth 100000 today, we would give you 65 k So I kind of had an idea of what it was just based on that. And that was the foundation of how I started you know, buying stuff. 
Right. So you started off lending from lending, then you were, you know, obviously getting educated, learning about the process of the game, and then you were confident enough to jump in. So uh, what specific things gave you that level of confidence uh, for our audience? Like, uh, was it the numbers? Uh, was it the lender that you found? Was it, you know, was it a mentor? Like, what was the level of, like, what made you finally say, okay, I can do my first deal? To be honest with you, I was just um, just being young and 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 dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I really wasn't thinking through many uh, you know options or like you know I wasn't thinking through too many things. But I think I kind of lucked out on this first deal because it was a house that an older gentleman was trying to move out of, but no one would accept his terms. Um, so you know, the guy was trying to move to a nursing home but nobody would want him to stay there for an extra like 60 days but we made it we made an exception we figured out something with our attorneys and that's all he needed that's what he was asking everybody for and he was yeah. even telling us the price that he wanted to sell the property for so you know we found a way to make that work and we got the deal mm, yeah i mean even for me like uh like I would say, and I tell a lot of people, I got extremely lucky too, because like I jumped in what five, six years ago, maybe maybe even longer, but like the wind really was against our backs at that time. You know, obviously housing prices were lower, uh, labor costs were a lot lower, and um, I, I I thought I knew what I was doing, but I think it definitely helped that the market conditions definitely um, definitely played a big part of our you know. I would say our success. Um, so things have changed a bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you right now, if I did the same things I did five, six years ago today, I probably wouldn't be sitting here having these conversations with you. So what are some things that um, people are doing today or beginners th that are doing today that you just can't get away with? Yeah, so before I was just being a little bit uh, generous on my rehab numbers, which meant that like let's go say i knew the property was going to cost 120k to rehab right to pencil in for my numbers yeah. i was like 100k <laughs> you know just so i could get the deal done yeah um but now that doesn't make sense anymore because you know the room for error is a lot smaller now right and you have to make sure that your numbers are uh, pretty tight to make sure it works right i think that's the hardest part right uh especially for beginners and people who just start right it's like the chicken or the egg right that's how i see it kind of um the only base that I could go by is either guesstimating like price per square foot or um, like honestly just through experience of like multiple rehabs myself where I can go inside of a house and then pretty much have a good indication of what I'm gonna end up spending based off of experience, right? It's easier for, for people like us to go inside of a house and have a good idea of what that renovation budget's gonna be. But let's just say for someone that's starting out or someone that's newer, like, what are some what are some suggestions that you have for him or her? I think the first step would be first, like learning how the market works and you know what are the price points that make sense for people. Because right. people who are buying right now typically are a little bit more seasoned, or you know they've probably done the game a little bit. So it's nice to be what people call in this industry a wholesaler. And um, you know I've met people who are wholesalers that. You know, they don't even know what they're doing. They just kind of come to me and say, hey, look, this guy wants to sell. This is the price. You know, help me negotiate the contract. Help me do this. Help me do that. And it's fine. You know, we'll, we'll work together because I, I see the value in building a relationship and, you know, getting access to deals that, you know, might not necessarily pop up other places. Mm -hmm. So you're you're referring to uh, if, if someone wants to jump in, a good place is to uh, find a deal. That's what it really comes down to. And that's what wholesalers do, by the way. Uh, they're going out there in however fashion or way, whether it's uh, knocking on doors, whether it's sending mailers, they're looking for deals and they're presenting it to real estate investors uh, such as us, right? Yeah, and, and the good thing about that is that you start to learn quickly about you know how you're calculating numbers and whether or not um, your price that you're offering to people is validated. And because of that, you'll, you'll have a sense of like what things are going for. Mm. Because in the beginning, you have no idea what the rehab costs are. You have no idea what these houses are going for. But if you start bringing like five or 10 people that are interested in buying a house, you'll start to notice real quickly like, oh, wait, everyone wants to pay more for this property than what I have it listed for. Or, you know, maybe I have it listed lower, and I mean, too high. 
and then you know you have to bring down your price and it also helps you with your negotiations and at a certain point you might feel ready to buy and you'll have the price points in your brain so that you know what are the numbers to go after properties at. Yeah, and that's also a good indication for as investors for us to know whether or not a wholesaler is experienced or not. So like if a wholesaler presents a deal and they're guesstimating that the rehab is gonna be, ten. I'm just making this up, like $10,000, and you clearly know, like how many times has that happened? Like someone will say, hey, the rehab's $10,000, but it clearly needs $80,000 of work. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty crazy. Um, I think the the most dramatic was during COVID because prices had gone up at least thirty percent. Right. So if I had a hundred k project, it would easily be one thirty just right. because of prices and stuff. Mm -hmm. So everyone would might might quote like ninety k, and you're just like, no, it's going to cost me forty k more. Um, but the real the real thing was that they were um, adjusting the ARV values. Because they're using ARV values that are not necessarily in line with the market today. Right. Um, right. They're looking for like you know further back comps. Um, they're using higher numbers, but like if you look at what's selling, you know you have to look at what's going on today, not you know a couple of months ago. Right. You know you have to be more recent. Let's go back on that ARV. So for our audience, what exactly does ARV stand for, and also what does it mean to an investor? Yeah. So the after repair value is like when you fix up the property. Um, what is it worth? So if you put in a brand new kitchen, brand new bathroom, what is the new value of the house? That's uh, that pretty much what is uh, what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's what what the home is worth after it's completely fixed up, just in simple terms. I guess that's the best way to put it, right? So um, yeah, I mean, with all that being said, I mean, you have so many projects that you're obviously going on, you're running on right now. Um, there's a lot of things that I want to drop as far as nuggets for our newer like type of listeners. Um, and um, I think getting feedback from experienced investors also is a very wise choice, uh, especially if you want to partner, partner up with uh, someone that's a, a bit more seasoned. Uh, Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets always used to say uh, it's better to get 50% of a deal, whatever, 25% of a deal than 100% of of no deal right so in theory and concept I think that's a great measure of just like you trying to get into the game and also uh, dipping your feet into uh, the waters so to speak and really learning um, the other thing I mean tell me your opinion on this but uh, paying contractors you know uh, paying contractors to look at the renovation and also giving you estimates is that something that you found a success in is that something that you would suggest for someone that would be newer because that's what i was doing when i first started i was paying contractors for the time to you know to give me quotes yeah it's hard to know exactly what's needed until you get some more experience in the game and you know potentially you can look to hire like a project manager to help you um, manage all the contractors um, but in the beginning I had zero experience so I was just kind of working on the fly just learning things as I went but even that like I didn't know like certain contractors or subcontractors have like scale of economy that would blast out you know whatever you know numbers I think I'm saving and do right. a much better job right so I think through the experience of going through multiple like contractors you start to realize that there's some things that are worth doing there's some things uh, not worth doing and then, you know, if you don't want to deal with it at all, you know, you can hire a project manager or, or hire someone to GC your project. Right. So that's honestly all through experience. And then obviously your your first thing that you said was building relationships, right? Like that's the most important part, especially with this whole contracting process. So um, your relationship with your contractors, um, as far as like how you built them, like, for someone that's just starting, like how, uh, like what would you suggest on finding a contractor, finding a legitimate contractor? I often tell a lot of beginners, uh, there's three things in a contractor. There's speed, uh, there's quality, and then there's price. I can't get you all three. I can most likely get you two of the three. I can get you one of the three, but uh, tell me what you want, and I'll be able to refer you that type of contractor. Are you finding that same level of experience or kind of uh, um, like concept or theory or is it something different for you? Like what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I actually mentally grade all the contractors that I have based on those uh, three topics. And depending on what I need, like if I need speed, I'll go with some other guy because I need to, you know, 
work out a project in a certain amount of time or you know if i need a certain quality if i'm doing rental grade it doesn't have to be like luxury finishes where you know the details matter a lot more mm -hmm. so i have to like carefully gauge what's needed at any moment as opposed to just you know just saying i only want it cheap i only want it expensive and fast you know like yeah. you never like you have to like work it out right it's all relative to the market so like you know we're saying we're you know we invest in philadelphia for example so the quality and grade of finish is going to be different in you know let's just say in Albany or in kensington then i'm talking about like you know kensington right um or like northern liberties right or fishtown so the the level of quality of contractor is going to obviously dictate that so something for our listeners to obviously keep in mind um but yeah i mean as far as how you started albert right and then kind of where you are has that changed at all as far as your strategy goes like tell me a little bit about that I mean, I, I went from, you know, doing everything cosmetically to doing everything fully gutted. Now, now is to some mix of a hybrid where right. it's just like, you know, what do I actually need to do? Because right. I think the danger sometimes uh, is that you over rehab because it seems so much better. Mm -hmm. But um, in the long run, it might not add that much more value. And I kind of look at, you know, an analysis of, you know, properties that we've bought and you know what returns they're generating the ones that you know i have a hybrid approach you know we have the best returns on mm -hmm. and also you know sometimes the cosmetic ones depending on you know like if if the uh, mechanicals and you know uh components in the house were in solid condition or not right so you know that's something to take in mind like fully gutted ones yeah there'll be less maintenance less headache for the most part but you know, you'll also be getting a lower return. So, you know, we're, we're working at a hybrid model right now where we're not doing 100% everything, like, fully gutted to the studs. But we're also looking in places like, where can we save? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what can we do instead of, you know, like, putting up walls everywhere? Maybe we can, you know, use a brick wall or something like that. Sure. So what are some things that... Um uh, so I, I want to be very clear with the strategies that we're talking about, because right now the strategies that we're specifically talking about is rental grade. You're not flipping the place, right? You're you're renting them out, right? Mm -hmm. So with that being said, where do you find some things that are considered to be non-negotiables as far as like repairs go? Like, are you getting a new furnace? Are you salvaging the plumbing? Are you... Uh, trying to keep some parts of the electric are you completely changing all the mechanicals or are you you know what i mean like what are some things that are helping you save money what are some things that you find that over a long period of time is just not worth trying to salvage like what mm -hmm. are your thoughts there yeah it really depends on the condition of everything like for example like i am looking i'm i just recently purchased a building and it has these 13 foot high ceilings on the first floor and it's tiled all the way to the top for me to take down the tiles and put up framing and all oh, this other stuff it's just it's just a nightmare so <laughs> yeah. what we did was what we're planning on doing is just cleaning up the tile and then you know running electrical pipe on top and putting you know outlets on top of that yeah. tile as opposed yeah. to like redoing the wall and all this other stuff right. so you know there's there's always going to be like um situations where you know you're going to have to make those decisions because you know that could be 15 15 grand after everything's right. all said and done and you know, with the market where interest rates are now, you know, that could be a deal killer for um, your deal long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, what specific things, though? Like, I know that there are some investors who I talk to uh, that think that, okay, you're going to have to change the electric every time. Or, hey, you're going to have to completely gut the, you know, the plumbing every time uh, because it's not worth it, you know? Uh, do you kind of draw that line and you just say, all right, well, you're going to keep some of those things or are you just going to like, what are some examples in that regard? Yeah. So it's a case by case. I mean, like I can't say that I'll always change the plumbing, but like I'll really start looking for signs of, of wear and tear. So if I walk into a property, for example, and I start seeing like um, patches on the ceilings all the time, um, mm -hmm. that typically starting to indicate to me that, you know, there was some leaks before they try to patch it up and you know they did a couple of rounds or whatever right um so i might i, rem I might replace it at that time um if the ceiling looks great and like it doesn't seem like there's much issues or like any signs of leaks um then i'll just leave it alone yeah so i mean it really depends if the if the property is like well taken care of if it's been lived in and it's been maintained 
and you get a sense when you walk through a property, you know, what kind of like status that's in. Right. If you feel like it's more maintained, then you're just like, okay, like there's probably there's probably less stuff to do, but you know, you also have to check with your team. Right. Right. And uh, a lot of that is like going also through checklists. Like once, like unfortunately, we're, we're for the most part we're buying properties with very minimal, if not no inspection. I don't know if you are, but I'm I'm not. But that's part of the process that I do as far as like having a checklist once we purchase it, just to make sure that everything's good, you know, in working order. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, apart from that, Albert, like you mentioned to me, you started obviously with. Um, like lending lending into you know doing your first you know your first your you know first um, project and then you kind of figure it out like oh am i going to do new construction am i going to do full guts am i going to do kind of hybrid model you decided to go with the hybrid model right so right right yeah, yeah. explain that explain that what you mean and so how that, how that works. i think it all depends on what's happening in the market right now and figuring out how to play the market so right now the market you know kind of feels sag soggy it, i mean if that mm. if that's a, if that's a way to kind of think about it where it's not necessarily moving but like you know you can probably get some stuff done mm -hmm. so you know in this market it doesn't really make sense to you know, go balls to the wall and just like tr try to buy everything and rehab everything and overspend. This is a, you know, a market where you like, you have to be fiscally smart about how you spend or have a way to generate extra value so that you can, you know, make your numbers higher right. uh, for an appraisal or, you know, to get your cash flow to where you need it to be. Mm -hmm. And have you, uh, like, have you ever seen uh, rents kind of, like, go in pace with how the prices of houses have gone? Or, like, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I have my opinions, but I just wanted yours. Um, the rents, I think the rents have been going up lately for the most part. Um, but that's really so market dependent, depending on, like, where, um, you know, the demographics of the people want to go and, like, what tenants are looking for. Um, and once you start seeing a shift, in the types of people in, in the neighborhood usually because like people are noticing that there's like um, something awesome about like west philadelphia for example then they'll start you know moving out there and then you know skipping queen village because right you know it's too small and you can get a much bigger apartment for the same price with right. a backyard right, right so you know you have to like look at these dynamics and see like where are people moving why are they moving and you know see what kind of amenities are starting to come in and with that you start to get a picture of what's what's um where the trends are and, and mm -hmm. where you're gonna see rent growth. I think one thing that you mentioned to me definitely struck to me at heart was that the this is the year where investors have to be extremely malleable, right? We have to be almost like a chameleon and being able to adapt to, to changes because right now I know that there are including myself, there are a lot of investors that are sitting on the sidelines just kinda watching and seeing what happens that's kind of like the phase that we're in um, because uh, numbers are tight um, and in order for some of us to make these deals work we do have to be a bit more creative um, I've seen a couple of investors do short-term leasing mid-term leasing like to you know to like to traveling nurses and stuff all the way to some people are renting rooms um, you know there's so many ways that people are being a bit more creative in this type of market uh, in order to get a deal done and um, you know I'm glad that you have like a very fixed strategy and a very malleable strategy uh, the one thing that I also I know that you do which is actually really interesting is the um, buy right like like something's built like as a multifamily buy right and you're like you know obviously bringing value that way so explain to our audience a little bit about that strategy and how that works yeah, so building by right usually means that if a property is zoned for multifamily, for example, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to go to the city for extra approvals. Mm -hmm. And there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, like you can go out and look at the you know lot square footage and look at the zoning and figure out like how many units you can put in, and you know you can figure out from the lot size you know what size units you can make. Um, generally speaking so that way you know you can price out your numbers and you might be able to potentially offer a little bit more than you know someone who's looking at it as just a single rehab mm -hmm. um, but even with these like they're still they're becoming a little tighter just because of the financing on the back end um, and you know rising costs I mean you know insurance and taxes are going right. up but right. you know it's, it's it's definitely like one of the one of the key aspects to look at is is like 
you know, what other value can you create here? And if you can make the value big enough, is it worth it to buy it at the price that, you know, what's the price that can buy that now? So are you finding that strategy being still implemented into your, like into your work today? Or have you like steered away from that? Have you gotten more into single families? I, I know that commercial space is a bit more, how do I say it? Kind of like a, it's struggling, right? A lot of like commercial lending and bigger commercial deals have been, you know, obviously been not as profitable, but like, what are you seeing opportunities right now in this market? I mean, there's opportunities every day, everywhere. I mean, the the real thing is that like, um, like what I would be normally like moved like easily to buy like two years ago, I wouldn't be so easily moved to buy today. I mean, the deal that I recently bought, the deal was just so good that I couldn't resist it. I mean, it had a lot of hair on it, but you know, I I can handle the hair. So that's just that's just what it is. You just have to adapt with the market. I mean, the market right now is just saying like you need to buy things cheaper. You need to be in a lower cost basis, so that you can generate more cash flow relative to how much you're into the property for. And um, because we invest in the city of Philadelphia, like, what's your general outlook of Philadelphia? Like, what, like, like you're, dude, you're from New York, right? So like, <laughs> why, why, why the hell are you over here? <laughs> Yeah, I think Philadelphia has has a has a lot of pros. Just because like uh, I came here in 2016, just to look around and and get a feel of everything, yeah. and um, I started to notice like, hey, look, you know, like amenities are good here, the food is good here. Like at some point, people are just gonna catch on and start coming over here because it's so cheap. Like I didn't understand how cheap rents were um, until I started asking around, and you know, rents were at least you know. 40 percent cheaper than new york like yeah. in this, in like queens and brooklyn so i was just like all right you know philadelphia is just a distant you know borough of, of new york yeah. in my mind and you know they had a transportation system you know there I, my outlook is that like philly philadelphia will do good in the long run it'll have some hiccups here and there right. just because of politics or, or whatever but you know eventually it'll recover and you know it's going to do pretty well no i'm with you there and i'm so bullish because like I have other like realtor friends, other investors, other friends that live outside of Philadelphia, and uh, you know we we, we kind of get overlooked by New York because we're like the younger brother, they're like the big brother, you know <laughs> what I mean? And uh, we are still a large city. What we're like the sixth largest city in America or something like that. So um, the historical job growth, the population growth, it's always pretty steady. It's not like booming like Houston or like you know orlando or any of those southern you know cities but i do find that the general growth and the general trajectory looks pretty solid um the other thing that i like to also mention to a lot of like newer investors is that um, we have to look at investing on i would say a couple of levels but the most basic level to look at it is either like um appreciation right um there's places like new york city right hawaii san francisco and then there's cash flowing cities right like detroit right the reason why i love philadelphia so much is because it has both aspects of that like you can get an appreciating market or you can be in the middle of a a very cash flow type of market um so um to segue into the next question like where are your well like what are your thoughts on that you know are you has any of that changed as far as how you play the game are you still looking for cash flow type of opportunities properties are you looking for appreciation plays are you looking for a combination of both like what's your thought yeah when it first came in i had a lot less money and i was just like look let me just go make as much cash flow as possible so i started targeting um you know working class neighborhoods um that I walked through and I was like, hey, look, this is a very solid place. The numbers look really good. I'm just going to start buying here. So I started doing that um, when I first started. And I think that has transitioned into me buying more appreciating properties. Um, not necessarily to the point where like I'm in like very high end luxury areas, but slightly better areas. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be like in a very cash flow neighborhood, cash flow heavy neighborhood because there's, you know, issues that come with those. Um, and the appreciation doesn't uh, go up as much uh, when there is a boom. Right. So I, I found that there's a good mix for me personally based on you know where I am to buy slightly closer to the better area and pay a little bit more so that I can have more cash flow. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I can have more cash flow than the, the heavily appreciating area, but also experience some appreciation. So yeah. 
I'm with you there. Like, I, I don't know if you ever played, and I was on a podcast with Aldo, and we talked about the game Cash Flow by mm-hmm. uh, Robert Kiyosaki. You ever played that game? Yeah, I played it. Yeah, yeah. So, like, where you actually start winning that game is not, like, when you roll the dice and you make money off of, like, cash flow and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You actually make money once one of those assets appreciate at a stupid value and then you just cash out Mm -hmm. and then you make like 10x whatever it was worth so i've learned over a period of time that uh most of us start including myself we start at a period where we look at cash flow and that's the only thing we think about but i think where people generate wealth like generational wealth is actually through appreciation and looking at and it's hard to quantify sometimes because obviously we need to uh there is some level of uh what's the word for it um just like instincts and like research that we might not even be able to like completely comprehend but um that's honestly where i find a lot of people make a huge trajectory in their in their you know in their real estate space mm-hmm. um i mean what are your thoughts on that yeah i think i think um appreciation is nice but you need to get to the point where you can experience the appreciation Mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is that real estate if it was the easiest game in the world everyone would do it and now you have to wonder why isn't everyone doing it and there are a lot of challenges um you know keeping the real estate while the property is appreciating and you know inflation is doing its thing right so you have to figure out how to handle those issues so that you can make it to the finish line of cashing out one day when you're like 20 years in a future or 10 years in a future five years in a future whatever it is yeah for sure and like a lot of the houses that uh are um and that's one thing that i want to add that's kind of random here but one thing that i want to add is that a lot of the homes that i thought had really good numbers and they still do have good numbers as far as like cash flow goes one thing that i overlooked was like the level of tenants that you're going to get right and the amount of quote-unquote work that you need to put in to maintain that property and like if you actually did your billable hour of like how much work you are putting into versus maybe an area that's a bit better or a letter grade better it actually might be worth your time to look into better you know i don't want to say better areas but areas that might have uh, statistically um higher income tenants um, higher income areas. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, what are your like? What are your general thoughts on that as well? Like, do you has that changed as far as your strategy goes, or like, what's have you just done better with management? Was there certain systems that you in place that were just, you know, a little bit more efficient? Like, I think I think it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of factors that go into certain things. I mean, I might have a property in a better area. <laughs> But, you know, we might have done a crappy job in, you know, selecting a tenant. So, you know, that return just went to the toilet. So I think it really comes down to, like, looking at uh, your systems and how you're doing everything um, to make sure that everything's signed up. And you won't know that until you go through a couple of iterations or or you bring someone on your team that, that knows how to handle those things. And, look, you're going to have to go through, like, experimental parts, and maybe you might get lucky. I mean, I know people who are lucky – And, you know, they really don't experience some of the challenges that, you know, I experienced. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a process thing. So, you know, there's also a thing of like you get cash flow, right? That's, you know, you look at that as like how much money is coming into my life. But you should also look at emotional flow (laughs) because emotional flow is more important. And that's why if you're looking to, you know, work in specific areas, if you're used to working in, you know, like a very tough neighborhood um, and you're perfectly fine handling that your emotional flow is fine because you know you work there all the time you understand the neighborhood then you should buy there but if you can't handle that and you know you're also have other obligations you got another business you got another job you know you have to factor that in because that's part of the reason why people leave is because they're mentally drained their emotional cash flows their emotional flow is out and how do you how do you make sure that you're in that safe space like obviously i think Personally, that does require a certain type of person and for the person to realize that they have a level of emotional flow, which is a great term, by the way. Um, but how do you how do you gauge that? Like, how do you make sure that you're in a good, good space for that? I mean, it's just going to take some experimentation because I think part of it, too, is like you have to go through it 
or at least talk to people who have gone through it so you can yeah. start to get an idea of what it's like. Part of it is like, are you comfortable walking on the streets? I mean, like if you're going to do it yourself, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to know if you're comfortable driving there at night. I mean, because there's some places that wouldn't probably drive at night. Just think about like the the types of problems that typically happen there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had one house. <laughs> Thank God, I like I I literally couldn't hold it anymore because I was just so emotionally drained. That someone got shot in the house. I mean, like I was oh, just God. like, well, it's yeah. like, come on now. I was like, and 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 the tenants weren't paying. So I was like, can I even deal with this anymore? It's like. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just so crazy. So you know, yeah. at some point, even I become a don't wanter for certain things. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, man, that's such a that's a, such a good point. Uh, I mean, it, it, are there ever times where, um, okay, let's just say you sell a house, right? You made a decision because uh, emotionally, you know, it it just wasn't there. Like it, w it wasn't helping your situation. Um, are there ever situations when you sell because uh, it's appreciated? to a point where you're like okay well this is a great time and if that if there is ever a point like how do you quantify that like do you have a number that you say okay well at this point it's a good time to sell and you just start selling well at this point like i'm not in the, in the harvest phase of, of the portfolio cycle yet so okay. right now we're the only things that we're selling is things that would um improve the financials of the overall health of the company mm -hmm. as opposed to just um selling it because it's popped and appreciated um the only time we'll sell that is if the appreciation has just gone so high and the rents haven't kept up and also the expenses like taxes and insurance have gone to the point where it's just not feasible anymore then we'll just go sell it mm. okay so uh um so with that being said obviously we've seen um in general uh, the national average is that currently most market cycles are in a in a correction phase. So uh, what that means uh, for our audience is that home prices have uh, it seems like they are coming down, but in reality they're just kind of in a in a in a in a in a phase where they're just correcting at the correct price of where it should have been priced because it was being overpriced. But what makes it really interesting is that rates most likely uh, within this year are going to end up going down. So, like, what are your thoughts on the market? Like, do you think that housing prices are going to go up or down or sideways? Like, and why? I mean, I really don't care which direction it goes because, like, I have a strategy for each direction. Um, right. The real question becomes, like, how do I, be, how do I play this specific environment it's not necessarily like, do I stop? Or like, um, mm -hmm. am I gonna do just do, do a different strategy? It's just like, how? You know, how? what makes sense in this in this situation? And I think, you know, I looked at that over the last like, year and a half, I just took off because I was like, oh, you know, market doesn't really make sense for me to do anything right now. So I basically, you know, took a vacation around the world. But, um, you know, now fundamentals are starting to come back and I'm like, okay, look, even though the rates are high, I can still buy things at, at a discount now. Um, and it's starting to move more back in line with what my numbers need to be. And now I'm seeing buying opportunities. Yeah, for sure. I'm also seeing them as well. And that's why like, I, even for me, I'm like jumping back in the game. And um, for our newer listeners, if you haven't noticed, um, rates have obviously have gone down, but I've also noticed with a lot of like hard money lenders, private money lenders, they've also have gone down on their rates. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of it's encouraging for people to buy right now, or there's signs or indications of buying, uh, which could leave for a lot of opportunity. Um, just kind of like a, I guess a fun question. Um, like, where do you think the market's going to be in five years? <laughs> um, just guess like I, I know I know a lot of the times like I, well people investors kind of move the way that like uh, you know the way that it goes they just kind of ebb and flow with it but yeah maybe maybe slightly up maybe okay okay <laughs> yeah I think I think that's that I think that's a pretty fair assessment in my opinion I think it would probably stay rather level if not a little bit up in pace of inflation that's kind of how I saw it um, but yeah, I mean, for, um, also for our audience, um, like, like how can they find you? Um, like what can they do to provide you value and what are you looking for? 
yeah i guess yeah so i'm on instagram at uh at mr underscore albert underscore woo wu and um yeah typically i'm looking for people who are you know on the street like sourcing deals even if you don't have an idea of like how to find like how to you know get things you know done i always have like a team with me that can you know guide you through the process and you know get it to the finish line so that's that's our you know main um ask at, at the moment just because i realize sourcing is the most important part of this game at this specific uh moment so yeah i mean i'll have uh all of his uh links and descriptions in in, in the podcast uh, description below um albert thank you so much for having the first podcast in an actual booth <laughs> and uh not on zoom and for you to come out and uh you know, honestly having a good time kicking it. All right, it was a pleasure. All right, homeboy. Thanks. John Lee Real Estate, find you the best rate. I'll do all Philly like Google Expressway. Talking to people who out of the 215, even the 267, who always helping like, oh, no oh. time for no scrutiny. Beautifully moving and know that's not up for the pay. Hey. For the people, we fall like an eagle and all have been called to do something great. Yeah.